graph enthusiast to graphstuff.fm, a podcast all about graphs and graph-related technologies. I'm your host, Jennifer Reif, and today I am joined by Allison Cosette, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with our guests today. I hope you are as well. Uh, joining us is Johannes Jokonen. Johannes is an independent consultant using his background in data engineering to help companies build their RAG applications. He also creates tutorials on YouTube around RAG, knowledge graphs, and LLMs. Welcome, Johannes. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Great to be here. So I did kind of just a, a tiny bit of research, but I was hoping you would kind of fill in uh, for the audience. Uh, I saw you uh, have done some things on Azure as well as some mm -hmm. LLM applications. How did you kind of get into that mix? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's quite a journey as it often is. Uh, basically, I started my career in in IT in tech uh, back in like business intelligence, like very front facing business intelligence, dashboarding, Power BI, this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, but then I pretty quickly started to just climb my way up the data pipeline into more and more data engineering type of work, uh, integrations and databases and data modeling. Uh, that kind of stuff. And then that's pretty easily led into more platform engineering work, uh, working with cloud platforms, mainly Azure has been my go-to, okay. uh, infrastructure as code, uh, deployment pipelines. Um, and that's that's basically been the journey up until that's what I've mostly been doing uh, up until last summer. Um, mostly working, doing consulting. So a lot of variety, different projects for different types of um, enterprise clients. Okay. And the turning point in terms of the shift to a, more of a focus to language model applications, which is now has been, has been the thing, uh, happened last summer, 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, at that point, I'd done some playing around with these, these language models that had taken the world by storm, but it was more of a sideshow at that point, trying to figure out if they can help me do my work better. Sure. But still, my main focus was still on the more conventional data engineering stuff that I had been doing. Um, but then uh, I was talking with a friend of mine, and we came up with an idea for a startup uh, that we got pretty excited about. The short version is that it was related to uh, working with travel information, especially like things like administrative things like visa processes and um, uh, becoming a resident in a new country, this kind of stuff, um, working with that kind of information to help people navigate that. And we also saw a big, big part of the idea was using language models and something like RAG uh, to make that kind of information more, more accessible. And that's, we really got excited about that idea. And that's really when I first got seriously building something uh, hands on and getting into all of this. And uh, that was something we worked on pretty intensely for several months. And although eventually me and my friend, we decided we had other priorities and we kind of put that project on ice, but the end result for me was still that I, I got hooked basically uh, <laughs> on, on, on LLMs and RAG and uh, decided to uh, shift, my, shift my whole focus uh, on, on doing more of that. Uh, so now I'm still doing independent consulting, like you said, uh, oh. but instead of the pure data engineering work, now it's, it's uh, figuring out how to uh, best work and uh, create data applications, with, but with the LLM twist. That, that's pretty cool, actually, because we've talked to some people in the past, and so far, a lot of who we've talked to has been building startups <clears throat> around LLM platforms or technologies. We haven't really talked to too many people who are using RAG and LLM applications to do other industries, you know, outside mm. of tech, things like travel, as you as you mentioned, your startup was kind of focused around um, and maybe other like general business use cases that you would see uh, outside of outside of just the tech sphere, if you will. Um, so that's that's really interesting. And I also saw you have a, a YouTube channel that seems to be pop well populated or, or kind of um has a lot of uh, content there how, how did you kind of get into that yes yes it is it is getting there becoming uh, more and more populated uh that i also started doing last summer and mainly the the main motivation was for personal learning because as you 
probably understand as like community creators yourself, it's a, just such a good way to learn uh, when you sit down and you decide, okay, I'm going to create a blog post or a YouTube video about this topic. Uh, you really have to like learn something very deeply, do a lot of research for a 10 minute video. If you want it to be good, you need to do right. enough research for a 200 minutes crappy video. <laughs> And uh, then setting yourself on some kind of a schedule. Okay, I'm actually going to put this out there every two weeks or once a month, even doing that regularly. Right. That's that actually my time. favorite way That's, to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It really, really adds up. I mean, we, we tend to kind of like be learning a lot constantly as developers, but it can yeah. often be kind of superficial and ad hoc. You figure out something just enough to get the code working, but you don't really go deep uh, in the same way as you do when you create content. Right. Uh, so that was the main motivation. Uh, I like the video format because it's also you also learn to speak better, which is a under underrated skill. Yeah, uh, definitely. And um, well, the last thing maybe I'll say is that wasn't part of the initial motivation. It's more of a thing that's surprised me afterwards. Okay, is the amount of community engagement that's been that's been coming my way as a result. Uh, like it's still it's still the channel is pretty small, and I still have a have a lot of <laughs> a lot of work. Uh, to do to do it more regularly but even then a lot of people have been reaching out just like people building startups uh, just wanting to share ideas share talk about their projects uh, you guys obviously getting to uh, talk in occasions like this um, it's really that's been so much fun that's been a ton of fun and it's really been quite surprising as well so this started as basically a, a way to learn the stuff, right? The the technologies oh, yeah, or the topics. 100%. Okay, cool. And then it's just kind of propagated as as it so often does, you know, to other people. Then picking up and learning from you, and then mm -hmm. kind of a engaging back with you, which is really cool. That's actually one of my favorite things about advocacy is the ability to learn something and then to share what you've learned with other people, hoping that it helps somebody or somebody can avoid the pitfalls you you yeah. hit along the way or so on. So, so yeah, I, I love that about content and I, I love that about kind of the, the technology industry in general. Um, is there like a specific thing in your videos you like to focus on topics or do you tend to go deeper or do you like kind of covering the basics or? Mm, I would say, I would say it's it's quite they they do go I do like to go quite uh, deep in doing something actually um, non trivial let's say and I think the hands on aspect is the is the biggest thing that I try and keep up because there's a lot of people doing let's say more newsy uh, types of videos Google just announced this OpenAI just announced that okay. uh, yeah. which can it's kind of it's more like can attract a lot of audience. But it, what a, a lot of people have been giving me as feedback for my content is that it's really helpful to also just have a very step-by-step, -step, more code with me type of a tutorial yeah. to kind of bring it uh, to practice. So that's that's what I enjoy doing. That's where how I learn the most yeah. myself. Uh, but that also seems to be uh, useful for a lot of people. Yeah, that's really great. I, mean, I love that. Yeah, I will say that's what actually I was taking the first time I saw one of your videos, what I was taken with is the fact that it is non-trivial and that it's very, I'm a longtime teacher in data science. And so I really like the way that you make it very achievable and it's a very sort of welcoming vibe, if that makes sense, um, in the way that you communicate with people. And it's just really like empowering, I think, the, the way that you present the material. It makes it very, like, people will watch and say, oh, I can, I can follow along with that. I can do that. So that's what I appreciate about your work, for sure. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So for those of you listening, if you have not checked out Johannes's videos, I will put a link in the show notes and and send you on over so you can you can check that out and code along with him if you so choose. So um, as far as kind of the, the core topic that I'm super excited to talk about today, um, you've done a lot, uh, as you mentioned, with RAG, uh, especially recently in the last few months um, with your uh, startup and, and some other applications and consulting, maybe. Um, and you wanted to kind of focus on today when it makes sense to choose graph databases for RAG, which is a short term for retrieval augmented generation, um, versus alternatives like using a traditional vector database. I say traditional, but mm -hmm. vector databases aren't that old, right? <laughs> um, and then uh, yeah, the, 
the even more traditional relational databases, right? So yep. if we could talk a little bit more about kind of your thoughts and, and your opinions and what you've seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I first got into graphs actually also as a, re a result of this startup, uh, because in our case, it was pretty clear uh, in the early stages of the development and exploration that a simple, a simple uh, vector store isn't going to do the trick because we did clearly need more structure in our data, more links and relations uh, between different categories. Uh, so that's how I got into graphs as well. I stumbled on some like great material from uh, Tomas uh, Bratanik from Neo4j. He's been he's been putting out great great articles and still yep. still does. He's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's he's amazing. Um, but what I have also been seeing, uh, especially recently, I I'll give you an example. Not too long ago, I was um, a guy. I was talking with a guy uh, who reached out and he wanted to do like a rag type application with legal data. And the data he wanted to work with was mostly like historical legal cases, case documents, uh, law texts, acts, this kind of stuff. Which probably can't be public, right? <laughs> uh, actually, actually, uh, I'm not sure about the. I think I think they didn't have the personified uh, information. Ah, okay. But uh, still, a lot of these cases, I do think they are public, uh, minus the uh, personal details. Mm. Um, but the main thing about this data was that it did have a lot of like links uh, included as part of the metadata. Uh, things like, okay, when, when there's a law, legal case, there's a final decision that's made. What's the legal basis uh, on law that that decision is based on? So you have some links on the related laws that are used in making the decision. Uh, you have links between laws and other laws. Uh, if you have a law set at the national level, that might be related to some directive at the European Union directive, or if you're in the States, uh, like a federal uh, legislation might trickle down into some uh, state level law. Mm -hmm. So all this interesting, interesting linkage uh, was there available in the data. So what he wanted to talk to me about was the possibility of creating a knowledge graph out of this data uh, to help people navigate the information, uh, which makes sense at first at a first gl glance. Uh, given the, that that data is available. But then when we actually talked about the use case that it was trying to uh, enable uh, for, for users of this application, uh, it really boiled down to mostly lawyers looking for precedent cases. So they are involved in an upcoming case and they want to do some research. They want to find past cases that are similar mm -hmm. that they can then you know use in preparing for this new case. And that really, and he this this guy thought, that would be like 90% of the uh, cases probably for the users of the application. And that boils down to a similarity search problem, right. really. You are just, uh, uh, can you can achieve something like that most likely with just embedding text and comparing those embeddings and you find similar cases just like that. Yeah. And uh, maybe if you also then want to retrieve the related laws for those documents, that's still only like one hop away. Uh, so then you can maybe bring in a simple relational database schema, uh, something like Postgres with a PG vector, which adds vector store support to Postgres. Okay. So you can do the similarity search and then also do the simple relational um, search in the same database. Okay. And yeah, I, I gave him the advice that I, I didn't think it really made sense to go for the graph approach at that point, because uh, although you can do you can do the same things, you can do similarity search, you can do vector, vector search in, in Neo4j, and you can, of course, do the one hop searches in, in a graph as well. But you do also add a lot of complexity yep. and some very specific challenges that I think we can also talk about uh, a bit later on. And if you can avoid that, I, I, I think it is a good idea to get started building something with a, the simplest possible uh, architecture you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are cases, and I think, you know, we, we have some content on this, but, but uh, it's, it's a tough topic to talk about is, okay, graphs are great for certain things, but then there's other things they don't handle so well, or they don't handle any better than other technologies out there. So, and I think what 
what you kind of recommended is, okay, it's low connected data, which means you don't have a lot of hops between mm -hmm. different types of entities. You're not having to do a lot of um, lookups or or joins as you would in a traditional relational database. You, if you only have one, maybe two joins, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to put that into a graph. You're not going to get massive amounts of value um, over something else in that respect. So I, I, I would tend to lean uh, in the in the same way that you recommended as well uh, with that. And that's that's one of the interesting things about databases and data in general is there's all kinds of solutions out there. And how do you know when to pick something? Um, and that's that's a tough decision to make for for developers and and others. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think obviously I, I, I do love graphs for a, for a lot of stuff. Otherwise, I wouldn't be on the podcast. Um, but the way I present it is more as a, like a long term, short term uh, roadmap versus a long term vision, uh, yeah. because what graphs do enable is a lot of more, let's say, advanced features, mm -hmm. uh, things like that have to do with something like recommendation uh, features or uh, in your system. Uh, those often do involve more complex uh, hops between different entities, doing things like collaborative filtering, looking mm -hmm. at what similar users have uh, liked or interacted with in the past and using that to recommend something to a different user. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's something that might be better placed somewhere further, further along down your roadmap rather than so like the first thing I'm going to build a I'm going to build a rag application and it's going to go from a zero to graph uh, which I think happens partially because it's just uh, it's such a gripping concept even visually the idea of knowledge graphs it's very intuitive uh, mm -hmm. which is one of the, its strengths uh, but that does I think blind people who are just getting into the field uh, to not think about the the trades off trade-offs and the challenges until they actually get totally slumped at some point and figure that they can actually uh, do this yeah, uh, it, in the in the in the let's say early stages yeah. yeah i think especially because everything around rag and gen ai is still relatively new for most people that there's so many different ways there's a lot of information and not a lot of experience on any given team and mm -hmm. so to have resources like this conversation and what you cover in your pod in your um, youtube it's really important to recognize that it's new for people and they don't necessarily developers don't necessarily know where to go i come from the data science side so for me it's much more obvious but now that we have developers that are really involved in building ai in newer ways i think just taking this very thoughtful approach to the data that's underneath and the database itself um is just such a really important moment so i'm glad that you're here to share what you've learned yeah and just to kind of take a step back for those who are maybe really really new to um kind of rag and llm in general um <clears throat> rag or retrieval augmented generation as it's as it's been shortened to to rag um I mostly think of it as using an LLM, but accessing an external data source of some kind. Usually that's a database um, like graph, like relational, like vectors um, or vector database, I should say. Um, and it's just using an external data source to add more information being sent to the LLM so that the LLM makes a more informed decision about what the response should look like. So for instance, if I want a recommendation on where to travel, um, but I have this personal data store of all the places that I've been, um, an LLM would not have that information. And so it might recommend you know, a gorgeous beach somewhere, but maybe I prefer mountains and maybe I've already been to two or three beaches and it might recommend someplace I've already been or someplace I don't really wanna go. So that's where you could potentially add the, the data source of all the places that I like and I've already been and send that over to the LLM and the LLM will go, oh, don't use these things, pick something else instead. And so then it can make a more informed decision and give you back a better recommendation for that. So just kind of take a quick segue out. Um, but maybe Johannes, you can talk um, maybe about maybe um, your thoughts on when a graph database 
maybe an example that you have that where a graph database was really successful or where others might not have worked well? And then <clears throat> maybe uh, something on your thoughts about the same about vector stored as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, on the first count, I think I can use my own example of the travel data we were working with. Uh, there was a very clear like hierarchy as well of like we we were structuring the data by region first of all so geographical uh, information you have a country and a country has cities and each city has like their specific uh types of information their points of interest but also their um regulatory uh, specifics so then just like navigating navigating down that hierarchy uh it's something that's difficult to do if you're just looking for let's say vector similarity because what's what's similar what, what a certain type of restaurant for example um what makes those kinds of restaurants a group can be shared across like all cities in the world so mm -hmm. there's no differentiation there whereas if you do have this graph uh, then you can uh, in a better way you can navigate down the down the graph into your uh, correct correct level of detail and especially like uh, if you want to do things related to like geographical distance uh, graphs are also great for that and yeah I think a recommendation system is a really good uh, more of an established use case for for graphs as well because again you are doing you are looking up connections in user behavior to all kinds of different content uh, that they have interacted with and then again what I what I mentioned in the past about the the social recommend recommendation that really depends on what other users you are interacting with and what those users uh, then do on the platform that can trickle down to your your recommendations or the way that the system is customized for you so anything that has to do with like social social connections that could also be like a professional social connections in a professional network mm -hmm. uh, another proof of concept uh, prototype I, I have been working on um, was related to finding experts in a in a in a company so finding experts based on not only their skill set which might be something you can do in a like a simple vector store with some metadata you can have each expert as a their own entity with some like just tags for the skills they have but as well as the skills we also wanted to find them based on the projects that they had been involved in the past so to see okay there's a new project coming up first we want to find some like similar projects and then we want to find the experts that were connected to those projects um yeah I think that's that those those might be the examples I can think of. So that's almost combining head. like a social and a recommendation <laughs> combination. Absolutely, <there>. absolutely, <laughs> and it's also like in general, anytime you are combining like different types of searches, um, okay. it might make sense to makes to make sense to go for a graph graph approach. Okay, and then um, I guess maybe briefly on just a a vector store. Um, what usually makes sense there? Is it just when you're looking at similarity searches and you're not trying mm -hmm. to find a lot of extra data with that? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. If if it's if you're looking for isolated pieces of information, that's the way I would I would put it. Okay. Uh, so whether that's by similarity or keyword or category or you know you can also apply things like uh, geographical filters if you have the geographical information. But the bottom line is that these points, individual points, don't relate to each other in a way that that's important for your search. Okay, uh, that's really what what a simple, like the 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 vector store is flat. Basically, there's no hierarchy, there's no links, there's no relations. Okay, uh, but often oftentimes that's that's enough because you can still, although you can you can have, you don't need to have links, but you can still have useful metadata like these tags I mentioned. If we were just looking for experts based on skills, we could do that in a vector vector store because yeah. you could just have that as a metadata field field, and you can filter by that. Okay. But the moment you start to want to have this uh, interconnected search where they depend on 
the results depend on what the people did with other entities or other people in the past, mm -hmm. uh, then then it starts to run reach its limits. Okay. And you also kind of had a, a note here uh, looking at entity resolution and deduplication oh, when yes. you're looking at a, at a knowledge graph and maybe what kind of challenges that involves. Yeah, yeah, that, that ties into this discussion with, okay, what exactly are the challenges in, in a graph? What's the, what's the reason there not to always go for it? Because it's, I would say, the most powerful option that can basically do what a vector store can do, and it can do what a relational database can do for the most part. But there is basically two main challenges that they are involved, and one of them is this entity resolution question. And so what that means is, is just the problem of uh, determining whether or not the records you get from different data sources are actually referring to the same entity. Right. So let's say, and that's relevant in this context of what pe a lot of people are exploring now is extracting entity and graph information from unstructured or semi-structured data and finding these implicit, making these implicit relations in some like documents more explicit. And right. then you can build your graph out of that. Yeah, it's a very promising, promising application. And these language models are actually really good at doing something like that. But the challenge there is that if I was going to extract some data related to cloud platforms, for example, then my data, my graph extracted data would probably contain things like AWS in lowercase, AWS uppercase, Amazon Web Services. But all of these three, are obviously, they are really, um, referring to the same thing. Sure. So what that means is that essentially every time you are doing this unstructured unstructured to graph data extraction, you basically need to add another step there, which is this entity resolution step. So figuring out, okay, which nodes are actually uh, in our raw extracted entities, which ones we need to merge, combine. Yeah. And um, that can be, can be very challenging. Um, there are some good methods methods there um, from simple business rules. You might have something like, okay, if two user nodes have the same phone number, then that means that they're the same user and we're going to combine them. But in this AWS example, for example, there, there is no clear identifier. There's no universal identifier you can use. Uh, in that case, uh, one thing I've been looking at for this purpose is, is uh, the similarity algorithms on Neo4j, mm -hmm. uh, which I think have a lot of promise for that. And I'm actually uh, going to plug uh, my upcoming demo on the Neo4j live in about two weeks where I'm going to do like a walkthrough of how to do this in practice. Great. I'll, I'll put but, a link to that in the show notes too. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. But the short and sweet of that is that node similarity, it's a similar concept as something like semantic similarity or vector similarity. But instead of being able to just look at similarity based on text, uh, these Neo4j algorithms allow you to compute similarity of nodes also based on their relationships. So if we imagine our three different versions of AWS, all of them are probably going to have similar relationships like parent company is Amazon, platform has service, Lambda, Amazon S3, EC2. And then looking at those relationships, we can compute a similarity score. That's probably going to be pretty, pretty high mm -hmm. between those nodes. And then we can perhaps tag them and then merge them into one. But, but it's like, it's something that's, there's no one size fits all solution for that. And you'll probably need a lot of different, uh, processes to like, make sure that all your different duplication problems can be, can be, uh, solved because if you are going to have these kinds of uh, different versions of same entities, then obviously it's going to, the consistency of your graph is going to suffer quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, all your data related to AWS is going to be scattered in different regions of the graph. And then you aren't going to be able to uh, get, the, get the information as reliably. Yeah, I mean, for me, the this idea of the entity resolution as being a, an, an integral part of the pre-processing when we're working on graph problems of all different kinds, we definitely see that. And again, anytime you're working on 
say in machine learning of any kind, really being able to get that data as tidy and clean as possible. But especially in graph, to your point, Johannes, you know, the, the power of graph is in the structure. And so when that structure is not reflective because of, you know, maybe missing out on that entity resolution step, it's, a, it's really important to have that be part of the pre-processing. So I love that you're pointing that out. Thanks. The other challenge you had mentioned is um, the the text to cipher. So mm -hmm. going from or doing a knowledge graph with retrieval augmented generation, um, fine tuning the LLM in order to generate that cipher code in order to run against the database itself and get the results back that you need. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's that's the second issue. Uh, one has to do with actually constructing the graph as we just discussed but then once you have the graph uh, you're also going to want to query it to make some use out of it and often the the obvious rag approach is to just take natural language questions from the users and then convert them into the appropriate cipher statements that you can run against the database right then and the again, user doesn't have to learn cipher right or yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. exactly uh, not not an ideal uh, if you're if you're using for a customer service use case or something. Yeah. Right. Mm, and again, like these language models, especially up to like GPT-4, they do have a pretty good understanding of Cipher. Generally, you can do simple queries uh, pretty well. Uh, but uh, if you're going to do more complex complex ones, which is often the reason why you want to use a graph in the first place, uh, then they do start to like run struggle pretty pretty fast and pretty hard uh, so one solution to this i think the necessary solution if you want to take this kind of uh, text to cipher use case into any kind of real life scenario is fine tuning so just using some examples of queries and then the correct cipher statements and fine tuning an open source model to be better at the cipher generation and i think i've seen some indication that that's definitely you can make them reliable enough to a production use case, but the challenge there is the data, of course. Sure. Um, because, well, first of all, you can't use a generic, um, publicly available training data sets of this kind of good examples for two reasons. One is being that one doesn't exist uh, right now. I know that uh, Tomas, again, is uh, working on a, this crowdsource initiative to build a training set like this. Uh, which I think is awesome. And I think that's going to help a lot of people uh, to, to do this, to improve the performance. But I think there are also a lot of use cases where these kind of like generic uh, cipher examples aren't going to be enough, but you're actually going to need examples directly from your graph. Uh, if you have, if you have in your specific use case, a lot of time-based queries, for example, and maybe you have a lot of different date fields in your graph, you have users with uh, registration dates and birth dates and you have transaction dates and uh, delivery dates, then these are things that might confuse the model in not knowing exactly which field to filter which query on. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so then that, that, that brings in the importance of having some examples that are very specific to you, but then making, getting those, generating, creating those examples, uh, isn't, isn't easy because you do need like thousands. Uh, ideally to make a make a significant impact okay so that would be the other part of the two biggest challenges that i see uh, i will add to that though that that really only applies to situations where you are having the language model generate the cipher from from scratch every time okay. and that's not always the case um, because you might be doing something very complicated for example, again, a recommendation engine, you might have a very, very monstrous cipher query to look at relationships between users and their history and all kinds of things. But that recommendation algorithm might actually be always the same with only things that are changing or maybe the user ID that's specific, the recommendations are specific to the user. And maybe if you're recommending movies, there's a genre parameter, but then the rest of it you can have just hard coded in your application and then all you need to do is actually just substitute the two parameters and then suddenly now this is a problem that's a lot easier uh, that you don't necessarily need fine tuning for 
So okay. it's it's a uh, it's a difference between having having a system that's kind of can generate arbitrary cipher statements and very flexibly any kind of queries that your graph could potentially be asked. Uh, if you want to support that, difficult. Uh, you're probably going to need fine tuning. But again, it's important to realize that okay, maybe in reality we only need to support three, five different types of query types, and we can have them actually predetermined. So instead yeah. of having the language model do 100% of the complicated query work, you're only leaving like the last two to 5% to the language model, and then it can actually uh, perform well. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's super helpful, I think, for, for those kind of looking at, um, I think it sometimes seems a, a black box on Okay, you have knowledge graph, you have LLM, you have RAG, you have, you know, and, and how does the how do all these pieces kind of fit together? Um, and I think we've kind of covered quite a bit of ground on, you know, when you might choose one thing or the other, and then the challenges that might come along with that uh, as you make those decisions. Um, I think this kind of wraps us up pretty well uh, for for this section, and we'll kind of jump right into the tools of the month. Um, Allison, do you want to go first? Sure. So my tool of the month is actually the PDF bot chunker script that is part of the uh, Gen AI stack that came out with Neo4j and Docker last fall. So um, if you go into Docker and you look for the Gen AI stack, you'll see it's one of the scripts in there. And I know a number of different people that have actually used it as a way to break up their PDFs without having to start from scratch. So that's my tool of the month. Awesome. That sounds great. What's yours, Jen? Um, so mine is, uh, I've been focusing lately on Spring AI. Um, I'm working on kind of building some demos or some applications. It's just exploring what Spring AI has to offer. So I, I've kind of done some other things with the Spring framework and some of the other tools that they provide, like Spring Data. They have a, a Neo4j integration. Um, but Spring AI also has an integration with Neo4j um, using Neo4j as a vector store. And so I've done some things recently on that. Um, and there's there's a, as with most kind of AI tools and, and things going on in that space, there's still a lot that's being learned and being uh, updated and uh, kind of made easier for developers as we kind of move along. But there's been some great response, um, some immediate updates made in, in the Spring AI library and ecosystem. Um, and the documentation keeps improving. Um, and so there's some really neat things there. And just the application that I've built, if you're already familiar with the Spring stuff, uh, it's pretty easy to get started um, and just kind of do some some really cool things and introduce LLM and, and RAG without going too far out of your comfort zone, I'll say. So Spring AI is my tool of the month. <laughs> um, Johannes, do you have one? I do have one. Uh, it's an it's a easy choice, actually. It's a library called Instructor. Uh, developed by a guy called Jason Liu, and um, basically what it allows you to do it's a it's a thin layer on top of the OpenAI API. You can also use it with uh, open source models, but what it allows you to do is allow you to define your desired uh, response in the format of a Pydantic class. So what that means is that you have some predetermined structure and attributes to your uh, response. So it's not just a string that you're getting back, but it's actually a Python object. Um, and yeah, that's that's really, <laughs> it's, it's a very simple library, actually, surprisingly little code, but it's just, a, it's more of a mindset mindset shift, really, because it's like, like the guy who developed the library, Jason puts it, it's, it makes interacting with the language models feels more, feel more like coding and less like trying to emotionally blackmail the language model into giving you, you know, val valid, valid JSON, for example, just like writing that so many times in the prompt. But it actually allows you to work with these, these objects that are more familiar to any programmer uh, in a way that's more readable. You can, you can see exactly what you are supposed to get back. And then also, if you don't get back, if you don't get back what you're expecting for whatever reason, uh, you can catch that quickly because these Pydantic classes have uh, validators that you can run uh, to see if, for example, age is greater than zero or 
if your full name has a space in between, something like this. And then yeah. if those validators fail, you can raise an error or you can retry again. And it's just, uh, it's, I'm only getting started using it more, uh, but it's a really, really wonderful, I think, mindset shift uh, above all. So highly recommend uh, Instructor. Uh, and also the guy who, who developed it, uh, Jason Liu, he also runs a blog and has some really great ideas uh, in general about RAG and how to work with LLMs. That's really cool. I'll definitely put a, put a link to that in show notes as well. So anybody else interested in the tool can check it out as well. So, uh, Johannes, uh, this is kind of the, the segment that we can kind of close out and, and let you take your exit if you would so choose. Um, so first, just thank you so much for joining us today and kind of uh, providing your wisdom and your experience um, of all these very complex topics. I know uh, I've really learned from it and, and been excited about it, and I hope that others will see that as well. So thank you. No, yes, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So much. It, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. All right. Well, have an excellent rest of your week. You as well. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Okay, Allison, do you want to talk about uh, the community project for this month? Sure. So this month's community project, I was lucky enough to also host the webinar that we did on it recently, and it was a, called Bridging the Gap. So Neo4j and Knowledge Graphs for Social Scientists. And in this particular project, the researcher was looking to find um, influential people and documents in policy formation, public policy formation. And we've got a few other, um, I think there's a blog that's going to be coming out soon, but we can definitely connect you to that webinar. So the idea is how can you, as a novice, take something as simple as a CSV, um, put that into Neo4j, also use the bot chunker for any of the links that you have to PDFs and put all that in together and run some very basic in like um, the data science was actually run in Bloom. And so there was no coding. So it's very almost no code leveraging of Neo4j to find um, influential people and documents and public policy. So oh, that's really cool stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you're not necessarily familiar with social science or not in that industry, um, that sounds like there's something in it for everybody here. So Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things for me, you know, as a developer advocate is how can we get this concept of knowledge graph into the hands of people in ways that are really low code, no code. And we have so many opportunities to do that. So again, going back to my tool of the month, the Gen AI stack, the Gen AI stack is a really easy way for folks to like go in, use the PDF uploader, load in their documents and talk to their documents directly. And mm -hmm. there's very little code that you need, a basic understanding of Docker desktop, um, but an ability to play with RAG and to play with understanding how all of that works and everything Johannes was talking about today. So right. for me, all roads lead back to the Gen AI stack these days. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. Um, so uh, shifting then from, from community projects and looking at articles. So things are starting to pick up for the year of 2024. I've noticed it was relatively quiet in the article and video and just general happening space uh, for the months of January and February, but we're starting to see some pickup now uh, for, for this month. So over the course of February, there's been a few things going on um, in the article space on the Neo4j developer blog. Uh, we have uh, a, a topic on updating the Graph Academy LLM courses with the new LangChain uh, version 0 0.1. So uh, Martin, uh, who's the author and on the Graph Academy team, uh, talks about how the new LangChain update is backward compatible, um, but you're getting some really nice uh, features now for things like in import, uh, or cha the imports changed, excuse me. Um, so there were some things there you, you have to update or fix. Um, invoking things is a little bit different. And then there are some changes to the agent as well. So if you want to learn how Martin updated our Graph Academy course with LLMs, or, or if you just want to see what the new LangChain version has in store for you, uh, if you've been using previous versions, uh, feel free to check out that article. There was also a really excellent article on a Gen AI powered song finder in four lines of code. Um, <laughs> so this basically the author wrote a cipher statement to run vector similarity search and pull a related album to search for 
a song that talked about X topic or a song that had this as the theme. Um, and it was really cool. Four lines of code, four lines of cipher. Um, and it would pull back really excellent results. Now he just looked at one particular artist and all of their albums over the course of history. Um, but you could, you know, find larger libraries or, or song groupings if you'd like to, to do a broader search, but just a really neat kind of short and sweet uh, example, but really powerful. The power of tiny code. <laughs> yes, exactly. Power of cipher specifically, Yes, <laughs> at least in this case. Um, so there was also an article uh, on the uh, object mapping changes for the Neo4j driver and .NET. Um, a little bit easier mapping. It's a new preview feature, so uh, be, be aware of that. Um, but you now have things like custom mapping, and there's some feedback as well. So if you check out that preview feature, and you have some positive or negative things you'd like to input back into our engineering department, feel free to check out the feedback there. Um, play around with that. Uh, Adam Cowley wrote a, an article on slow cipher statements and how to fix them. Uh, cipher is one of those things that it, it's a very challenging puzzle to me, but I find it super interesting and cool. Um, so Adam was looking at debugging a Graph Academy course. There were some issues with some uh, people running into slow cipher statements there. And so he talks a little bit about how to understand the cipher planner, um, how you deal with dense nodes and how to route around those, and then utilizing specifically an index in your query um, so that you can kind of high power that and improve the, the speed there. There's a, another article on Langchain uh, to process YouTube playlists and perform Q&A flow. So that basically pulls uh, YouTube transcripts and shows you how to chunk that up and create a graph out of that. Um, so again, Langchain and LLM focus there. And then there's an article on PyNeo instance, which is a user-friendly Python library for Neo4j. Um, so the article is up on the Neo4j developer blog there if you're interested in more Python-related stuff uh, with Neo4j. As far as videos go, uh, not too much happening in the space, but if you missed Nodes 2023 and you want to catch up on that, there's still a few videos trickling out. So definitely refer back to that and, and keep an eye on that playlist. Um, just in closing, uh, the event section for this episode <laughs> could have been absolutely forever. I probably could spend 20 to 30 minutes just on events this month. It's insane. But um, I'm just going to highlight a few things and I'll put everything in the show notes so you guys won't miss anything. Um, but it just kind of highlight and, and point out a few key things that are going on this month. So on March 5th, if you've been following the Going Meta series with Dr. Jesus Barasa, um, there's another uh, installment of that occurring on March 5th. Um, so it talks about a series on graphs, semantics, and knowledge. Um, so episode 26 is the one that we'll be airing this month. So feel free to check out that live stream. Uh, on March 6th, there's a couple of meetups going on, actually, both virtual. One is exploring graphs and generative AI and locking new possibilities. And the second one is pass or play. What does Gen AI mean for the Java developer? And that second one, actually, I'm the, the presenter on. So check that out. So that'll be both those events are March 6th, which is next Wednesday. OK, uh, March 7th, there's a meetup in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, so the GraphDB Bangkok meetup with the GraphQL Bangkok uh, meetup as well. So check that out if you're in the area. Um, on March 11th, there's a training. So we have a, a few different training series going on, uh, all virtual. So the first one is going to be Knowledge Graphs and Large Language Models Boot Camp. Um, and then there's also on March 11th, a workshop in uh, Bengaluru, India on Neo4j and GCP generative AI. So there's a couple installments of that workshop occurring. The first one happens uh, in India on March 11th. March 14th, there's another training that's going to be virtual. That's an intro to Neo4j. So if you're just getting started, kind of want to know uh, across the board basics, feel free to check that out on March 14th. 15th, there's a couple of meetups, um, both in India, one in Delhi and one in uh, Bengaluru. Uh, one uh, in Delhi is on Pythonistas and Graphistas, navigating the world of graph databases with Python. And then the one in uh, Bengaluru is Graph Genesis, building tomorrow's insights today. On the 18th, you get another Knowledge Graphs and Large Language Models Boot Camp. That's a virtual training there. Uh, workshop on the 19th, another virtual one, <laughs> talking about tame your graph with Liquibase for Neo4j. So if you've worked with Liquibase or are curious about it, feel free to check that one out. Uh, March 20th, there's a meetup in Melbourne. Uh, so for their March Madness. So if, there's, if you're in the area, check that one out. 
March 21st, another training, a uh, virtual one. So this is one that's uh, provided by us as well. Mastering Neo4j Deployment for High Performance RAG Applications. This one sounds kind of unique and very interesting to me. So <laughs> hopefully uh, you all get a chance to check that one out. On the 26th, there's a meetup in Sydney, Australia. Um, that's Unraveling Connections is the topic there. There's a workshop that same day that's also virtual. This is going to be large-scale geospatial analytics with graphs and the PyData ecosystem. So if you're interested in those topics, that's March 26th, a virtual workshop. And that should do it for this month. Again, there's lots more <laughs> events, but I will link all of those in the show notes. And don't forget to check out our Neo4j events page as well for the full listing. So Allison, any final thoughts? No, I, I, to your point, there's so much going on in the space. It's really exciting. I know a number of folks from our team are also going to be in Las Vegas late this week, uh, or late this month, around the 25th to the 28th at the Microsoft Fabric out in Las Vegas. So if you want to come by and say hello in person, we'll be out there as well. But things are things are cooking, and we're really excited to have so many opportunities to connect with the community virtually and in person. So definitely stay tuned. Tuned, and we look forward to seeing you out there. Sounds good. Thanks, Allison. Bye. Bye. Bye.